Ace King offsuit, Under the Gun plus two. Under the Gun plus one calls the 50. He's the player that I just three bet previously. I raised a 200. He calls, we're heads up, the flop comes. Queen Jack 10 rainbow, we flop the nuts in position against a tilted player while playing by far the biggest game of my life. The opponent checks, thinking about how I can make the most money possible. The limp called preflop, so I can't imagine he's gonna have all that much that'll connect with the board of all high cards. I go with a bet at 175. It's a down bet, but I wanna keep his calling range wide. Should never really have a set on a board after limp calling preflop, and there aren't any draws to worry about either. He thinks it over, then makes the call. Really want this turn to be a blank, but it's not. It's the queen of hearts to one of the worst cards in the deck. If somehow my opponent called for the queen on the flop. He's likely to have another Broadway card to go with it. Many of those are now boats. The opponent checks. Not too worried yet, and I don't want to check, giving the opponent a free card and a chance to take the lead. I bet 350. The player just flats again. This would be a great time for a deuce on the river. Not today, dealer's making it difficult. It's a nine, the opponent checks. I'm additionally losing to queen nine and pocket nines now, but any eight or king makes it straight, so I can definitely extract value from those types of hands. Pardon me wants to check because this board has gotten a little scary, but there's just too many hands that I can get value from, so I go for it, betting 800. The player doesn't look thrilled, he thinks it over for quite some time. He eventually tosses in a chip to make the call. I turn over the ace high straight, and it's a winner. I get three streets of value, inducing what I believe is a light river call out of the opponent. I don't have the slightest idea what he had. I take down a big pot for me, but really it's just a medium sized pot for this game. I'll take it. I'm all the way out of the $1,700 hole I was in earlier, and I'm currently up 1,000 on the session. Next, we're dealt ace king offsuit in the big blind. Cutoff opens to 140 with 3,500 total in front of him. He's the same player that I beat when I pocket queens earlier. I'm gonna make this more. Pay attention because things escalate quickly from here. 600? 600. Call. What do you wanna do? Once? All right. We're running it once in an all-in pot over $7,000. If I win and cash out, I'll have the largest winning session of my life. For that to happen, I'm gonna need some help from you guys. On the count of three, let's hit the like button for some extra run good. Ready? One, two, three. The flop is 10, eight, six with two hearts. Oh God, we don't even have a heart in our hand. The turn is the four diamonds. It's absolutely no help to us unless we improve the best case scenarios that we're chopping. For those of you who for some reason didn't hit the like button previously, there's still time to do it so that we can get a good river. Unfortunately, the river is the deuce of spades. It's a complete brick. We don't even have a pair. This is why it's not great to get it in pre-flop with Ace King. I'm not feeling even the slightest bit confident. Then we hear. By some miracle, Ace King is the best hand. The player next to our opponent said that he saw the cutoff jammed with Ace Jack offsuit. I'm like a young Devin Hester out here catching punts. We ended up getting a great run out, and in the heat of the moment, we didn't even realize it was happening. That's why you get it in with Ace King for several thousand pre-flop. I was feeling super confident the entire time. Okay. Not really, but I do think it's a tell when someone snap four bet jams, which is why I called so quickly. Usually if an opponent has aces or kings, he'll pause to consider all available options and at least make it look like he has a real decision that he's mulling over in order to invoke lighter calls. When people act without much thought, they're often trying to exude strength to intimidate people into folding. The fact that I three bet the hand earlier against them with queens and overbet pot on the flop without getting to showdown, then jammed with tens in the other hand against a different player without getting to showdown, probably gave off the impression that I make a lot of moves. He might have perceived me as an overly aggressive opponent who could have been three betting light. To four bet jam ace jack offsuit, the opponent was likely at the end of his rope dealing with my shenanigans, then ultimately picked a bad time to try and get one through on us. Battles with Spraggy would continue, I pick up ace king offsuit under the gun, I open to 15. Under the gun plus one calls, Jeff Boski calls in middle position, Spraggy three bets to 70. Flatting and four betting are both reasonable. I don't love the idea of flatting and playing this out of position, especially since there are two other players behind me that will be getting a good price to also flat. Then I'd be playing a multi-way pot with three opponents having position on me. I four bet to 250. Under the gun plus one folds, Jeff folds. I don't think Spraggy necessarily would have three bet light after I raised from early position. He apparently has something that he wants to see a flop with. He calls the four bet might have the same hand as me, or he could possibly have queens or jacks. There's some very small chance that he has aces and is trapping, but there aren't many combos of that left. The dealer puts out 5-3 deuce rainbow. We don't have a pair, but we have a gutter and two overs. I don't quite know what to do. I down bet to 175. 
This doesn't really accomplish a ton, except hopefully allow me to see a turn cheaper than if I checked and Spraggy bet. Spraggy doesn't want me to see a turn cheaply. He raises to 400. This is very annoying. It's only 225 more. Spraggy has about 550 behind. I consider shoving since we could be chopping. We're all up around 40% equity. I'm still not completely convinced that Spraggy doesn't have aces. If he does have aces and I jam, I'll be gifting him all of his chips back. I definitely don't want to do that. I call the 400. We're playing another huge pot together. The turn is the seven of spades. We don't improve. I check. My hand is almost completely face up. If I had something like aces or kings, all my money would already be in the middle. Spraggy's a good player. He knows that I likely don't have a pair. He has one move and he makes it. I feel like you have something so dumb here. Well, you have ace king. Oh. All right, you have ace king as well. You have ace king. I know you have ace king. What do you have? Huh? What do you have? That would ruin the game. At this point, half the table has their phones out recording. This is Boski's camera angle. You can see the player next to Spraggy with her phone out. Next, brace your eyes for the one seats angle. Unfortunately, the lighting on it is way brighter, but it's the best view, mostly because you see 500 bitches in the five seat. I'm completely torn by the decision I'm facing. I don't want to call and lose, but what's worse would be if I fold and Spraggy shows me ace king or ace queen and I become the 501st bitch at this table. Do the math, Brad. You used to be in the county. Are you? Did you just start a vlog? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the sick thing is, I could show you my hand and you still wouldn't know what it is. Well, that's an interesting bit of information that clearly rules out hands like aces, kings, ace king, and ace queen. He has to have a high pocket pair, and I'll still have 10 outs. Spraggy was chattering a lot, but then he seems to be at a loss for words once I guess his exact hand. We'll go back to Boski's angle for this. I used to have like, I used to have jacks, and queens. You have like queens? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Now that I know I'm at least not getting bluffed, I feel okay about letting it go. All right, man, you win. Nice hand, nice hand. Let's see it. If I show you, I ruin it. I guess you have something too good, huh? You have something too good to show. That's the problem. Spraggy would later confirm that he had queens. He was right that he could have turned his hand face up and I wouldn't have known what to do. That's because I was getting 3.4 to 1 on a call and that's the exact price that I need to break even given the fact that I had 10 outs with one card to come. In my mind, it was best not to give Spraggy a chance to win all his chips back though, which would have been the outcome almost 80% of the time. The very first hand I'm dealt is ace-king offsuit. I'm first to act after Alan has put the $400 straddle on. I raise to 1,000. Mo makes the call with 8-7 offsuit, a bit light, but not the most shocking thing that we'll see today, or even pre-flop in this hand since Allen defends his straddle with 6-3 offsuit. We're going three ways to the flop, the dealer puts out 7-5 deuce with two diamonds, everyone has something. Allen checks his gut shot straight draw, I'd like to maintain control of this pot, I could have the best hand, if not, I can hit an ace, king, or run a runner diamond to be best, even if just one more diamond comes out at some point, I can put a lot of pressure on my opponents with the blocker to the nuts. I bet 2400. Mo has top pair and can't go anywhere just yet. He calls. Allen reaches for chips right away, despite only having three outs that he'll feel good about. He calls. I'm getting concerned that this pot won't be going towards us and we're going to be stuck immediately. Don't worry right now though, things will get even worse. The turn is the nine of clubs, making it so the most likely straight draw gets there. Hands like 9 7 improve the two pair as well. Allen checks. I can't keep plausibly betting at this with two opponents. I'll never have the nuts. I check with plans to give up. Moe's downgraded to second pair, but he at least picks up a straight draw. He checks back, so I rule out him having two pair or better. The river is the king of hearts, giving us top top. I love it. Allen checks his six high. There's no reason to think that he has anything strong. This would be a good card for me to bluff if I had something like queen jack. I might bet large to try and get people to fold in that instance. I need to bet similar amounts for value to stay balanced when I actually have it. I bet 8,000. Perhaps I can get called by 9-8 or someone who had a king high diamond draw that's now become a worse pair. Mo folds, there's not much that Allen can do with 6-3, he folds, we get a nice river card to be up $7,000 the first hand that we sit down to. That helps settle the nerves a little bit, then Mo says something that I would have preferred him not to say, especially in front of Ivy. I think you've moved up since I last watched you. I remember this high. Oh shit. You can see Ivy's eyes dart towards me, he's sizing me up. 
I certainly didn't want him knowing that I'm currently shot taking. Usually, you want to give him as little information as possible so that he doesn't use it against you. An hour later, we get the opportunity when we've got Ace King offsuit under the gun. I raised a 30. The dude who beat us in the previous hand, 3 bets to 130. He started with 1,065 total. I'm happy to get it in against him for that amount if I need to. I 4 bet to 500 to either take this down without seeing a flop or to essentially force the hijack to jam if he wants to stick around. If he just flats, he'll have about half a pot size bet left in the stack, so surely he won't do that. This man is a square peg that I tried to put into a round hole. He calls for 370 more for the sole purpose of making my commentary wrong that I obviously do weeks after the session is finished. We're heads up in a 4 bet $1,000 pot out of position. We might need some help. There's no better way to get that than by asking for you guys to smash the like button on the count of three for some extra run good. We haven't done this in a long time. Ready? One, two, three. The flop comes ace, eight, seven, rainbow. We've got top, top, and what's very likely the best hand. With my opponent having such a short stack, I don't want to give him a reason to fold if he has queens or jacks. I super down bet to 150. With implied odds, he's almost getting the right price to call with a pocket pair, but I'm betting on him not being able to drill a set on the turn. This move also gives him some rope to jam as a bluff if he thinks my bet looks extremely weak. If he has ace-king, we'll unfortunately be chopping. If he has ace-queen or another worse ace, we shouldn't have any trouble stacking him. The opponent is perplexed, and I don't blame him. It's pretty clear to me that he doesn't want to fold for this small of a sizing, but he doesn't want to call without an ace in his hand either. He's probably thinking about how he won't be allowed back in his home game if he folds right now while getting nearly 8-1 to on the call. The hijack matches the bet and only has 415 in his stack. He's chest deep in quicksand and needs some help before he gets completely buried. The turn is the 10 of hearts. It's possible that the opponent drilled a set. I can't be too concerned about that with effective stack sizes being so small, especially in relation to the size of the pot. I only have one move. Luckily, I don't get snap called, so I either for sure have the winner, or this is going to be the most epic slow roll of all time. The opponent is looking at what's in the pot, then looking at his stack, then looking back at what's in the pot, there's 1730 out there and he only has 415 in his stack. Well over a minute goes by, then the hijack finally slides his chips in the middle to make the call. This is a big all-in pot. I'm not sure what we have to fade. There's almost no way that we've got the check mark yet though. The dealer puts out the nine of hearts, completing not only the backdoor flush draw, but there are four of the straight out there as well. I at least add the ace of hearts, making it a lot less probable that I'm up against a flush. I show my hand first, not totally loving it because Jax is a very reasonable hand that the opponent could have, which is now beating us. The hijack doesn't appear to be too happy. He looks like he's going to muck his cards face down. Then he says, Hey guys, before I return these cards to the dealer, I want to show everyone the sick finger tap dance routine that I've been working on. Let's play that back. I was doing it with two fingers, but I can also do it with just one. I know hundreds of thousands of people are going to watch this vlog, which made it the perfect opportunity to showcase my skills. I have to admit, I'm pretty impressed, but I like my act a little better where I make every one of his chips disappear and eventually become part of my stack. We're up about 800 with plans of adding to that amount. 10 minutes later, we've got ace king offsuit under the gun. There's no straddle on. I raised a 30. The player on our direct left is the best opponent in the game. I've tangled with him in the last two vlogs from the win. In those, we got into several three and four bet battles, including some in the uncapped 10, 20, 40 game. Luckily, I've gotten the better of him up to this point. Under the gun plus one needs to get revenge. He three bets to 100. Normally, an early position three bet is a very strong play. We've got removal to aces and kings though. Plus, I know this particular player is extremely aggressive, so his range isn't necessarily going to consist of only premiums like it would if we were facing a three bet from a more passive player. Small blind inserts himself with a call into what's minimally going to be a four bet pot. He likely would have four bet pocket kings and aces if that's what he was holding. Since he didn't, I'm confident that I'll at least have two overs to whatever the small blind has, or we'll have him dominated. I 4 bet to 400 in a tricky spot, hoping under the gun plus one isn't at the top of his range. He must have been just messing around as he folds. The small blind is having a difficult time trying to find the fold button. With the clock winding down, he calls for 300 more. I imagine he has some sort of pocket pair like queens down to eights, or maybe ace king or ace queen. We're heads up. The flop comes king 6-3 with two hearts. Not only did we drill top top, the right suit came out so that we don't have to be very concerned about our opponent having a flush draw. The ace and king of hearts are both accounted for. It's very unlikely the small blind cold called a three bet, then called a four bet with two hearts that don't contain the ace or king of hearts. The opponent checks. Since I put him on hands like middle to high pocket pairs that we have crushed, and since we don't need to worry about more hearts coming out, 
I want to bet small to extract as much value as I can or induce a bluff. I bet 200. It's a little more than 20% of the pot. Things are going exactly according to plan as the small blind check raises to 500. I doubt he would have cold called a 3 bet, then called a 4 bet with pocket 6s or pocket 3s. There aren't any 2 pair combos that make any sense, and we ruled out aces and kings based on his pre-flop play. The best possible hand I envision the opponent having is also ace-king, but to be honest, this feels way more like a bluff attempt with a random hand. I don't want to chase his bluffs off. There's some confusion at the table because the dealer didn't hear the opponent say raise as he put out the purple $500 chip. He thought it was just a call. We make sure that that gets cleared up because I feel very confident that we've got our opponent in bad shape and I want as much of his money in the middle as possible. I call for 300 more. The pot has become very large. And we've got what's essentially the nuts. The turn is the 10 of spades. Pocket tens is a somewhat plausible hand that the opponent might have check raised with to see where he's at and to fold out hands like ace queen if that's what I see bet small on the flop with. The small blind is like the longtime talent agent for Frankenstein. He continues to rep a monster. The opponent fires for 600. The situation has become a bit dicier. Mostly, I feel pretty good about it though. We're certainly not exiting at this point. I call. A blank would be ideal at the moment. The dealer isn't interested in making life easier for us. He puts out the jack of diamonds. Now ace queen, pocket jacks, king jack, and jack 10 are all new hands that have us beat. They're not super likely holdings that the opponent would have, but I'm believing more and more it's possible that the small blind could have them, especially when he jams for 1295 effective. I honestly have no clue what to put the opponent on. This line doesn't seem all that credible. I underwrapped my hand on the flop. I'm not sure exactly what the small blind is trying to represent. When I can't piece together the story that the opponent is trying to tell me I'm getting a good price, I typically stick around. After only a few seconds, I basically snap call, expecting to be beat fairly often. What's incredible about this is that since I'm getting almost 3.5 to 1 on a call, I only have to win 25% of the time for this call to be profitable. That means I can actually call and lose 75% of the time and still make money in the long run, which is absurd. We don't have to worry about losing this time. We get the victory with our top pair despite the board getting worse and worse for us. It's a full double that was sparked almost entirely by our small bet on the flop that induced a check raise and two subsequent barrels including a bluff shove by our opponent on the river. It's sweet to get this win, acquire a few purple chips, and have plenty of wiggle room as we're firmly in profitville for the session. It's fun to play deep stack 300 big blind games when we're able to capitalize on having a larger stack. While a few guys are still playing poker as if they're taking part in a preparation age commercial, Sashimi has pocket tens in the hijack and raises to 30. Ron loves King Jack offsuit more than Matthew McConaughey hates wearing t-shirts. He calls with it once more. Radley's trying to fight, or is right, to sit down. He calls with 9-6 suited. McLovin has to make sure that Radley doesn't win the pot, otherwise McLovin will have to pay everyone $50, so he comes along for 25 more. We wake up with an actual hand in the third blind. It's time to punish everyone with ace-king. I take a second to assess the situation and figure out the sizing that we should go with. I make it 200. Sashimi thinks that I'm trying to buy it. I wouldn't mind if everyone folded. You can see that I have the most equity, but it's still only at 28%. Sashimi puts in the 4-bet to 500. She's really only supposed to be 4-betting me a very small percentage of the time. Pocket 10s actually does better as a flat because Sashimi could be crushed or will be flipping a lot of the time. If she called and allowed the other players to call behind her, that isn't that bad since she'd be playing mostly to hit a set and it's often good to have more opponents in the hand when you have a set, particularly when the stand-up game is on and people are playing all kinds of junk that they're incentivized to bluff with. It folds back to me. We know one ace and one king are accounted for, cutting in half the amount of combos of pocket aces and pocket kings Sashimi could have, which are really the only hands that Sashimi should be forbetting us with for value in this spot. There are only six combos of those total. Meanwhile, there are nine combos of ace king still available that we could be up against, so I put her mostly on that, perhaps queens, jacks, or some other type of bluff. I call for 300 more, which I might also do with aces as a trap, and then hands like queens and jacks. We're heads up. The flop comes 883 rainbow. We've got nothing and we're up against an overpair. I check. The opponent doesn't need to bet too much here. She fires for 400. I could call because I'm getting a good price. I'm not 100% sure what I'm up against, but 
I've significantly discounted aces and kings since we have removal for those. Several other holdings will have a relatively difficult time calling a check raise when I can still have queens, jacks, and even rockets. Ace-king is still a very likely hand that we'll be up against. If I call here, Sashimi could potentially get me off a chop later down the road, but if I raise, she'll have to fold these highs, including ace-king, a good percentage of the time. If she calls a check raise, I can just give up if I don't improve, knowing with a decent amount of certainty that we're beat. One thing that I noticed from Sashimi in previous hands is that she tends to play very aggressively pre-flop and could have a wider 4-bet range than she's theoretically supposed to. With this in mind, I could actually have the best hand fairly often. I don't really like folding or calling and playing out of position in a large pot without a ton of showdown value. The opponent just doubled up and likely won't want to immediately lose a massive pot right after. The graphics for her stack are incorrect, by the way. It says that she has over 8,000 in front of her, but in reality, she has about the same stack as us. She's not going to want to get stacked after she just got those chips. If she has a close decision, I imagine that she may lean more towards taking a less risky line. I'm considering all these factors, then eventually decide I'm going for the home run. I make it 1300. Sashimi isn't happy to see that. It's hard for her to imagine that I'd have called a 4-bet pre-flop, then check-raise flop without something better than 10s. On the flip side, it'd be super sick if she ever shoved here as a bluff since I'll only sometimes have aces and I'll have to fold nearly everything else. There's no shove this time. Sashimi somewhat over-aggressively played her 10s and I applied the aggressiveness right back to induce the fold from the best hand. We get a massive bluff through to break into the green today with some style points. What a play by Brad. Incredible play. Gets through. Strong and the play. Brad Owen fans go wild. Good play, Mr. Owen. Like, like a, to a lot of people, that just looks like Sashimi made a bad fold, but Brad literally played that hand perfect, like he had jacks or queens, um, so she could have been dominated pretty easily there. Next, we've got ace-king offsuit in the big blind. The straddle is on to 40. The hijack raises to 120. He's a good pro. The small blind calls. We've got a three bet this. I make it 600. The initial pre-flop raiser calls. The small blind folds. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 5-3-3 three, three with two hearts. We've got two overs and backdoor draws. This is an interesting situation because we're the pre-flop aggressor and we have potential. I'd like to keep control of the pot by firing again to possibly win immediately, but most of the hands that we're beating, like low to medium pocket pairs, are going to call at least one bet, so we might have to double barrel. I bet 800. They should mostly get folds from hands like suited Broadway cards and smaller suited connectors that don't contain hearts or diamonds. The opponent calls without thinking too long about it. It feels like we're up against 8s or 9s with a heart. The turn is the 4 of hearts. We pick up the king high flush draw and the wheel draw. If I check, I'll definitely be calling a bet, so I may as well force my opponent to make a tough decision when I put money in the middle. I bet 1900. They should start folding out hands containing two diamonds and pocket eights. The opponent is taking his time thinking about what decision to make. I've been playing live poker since I was 15 and I'm 35 now. This is when having that experience watching people helps because it appears that the hijack is genuinely debating between multiple options and it looks like he doesn't really like any of them. A minute and a half later, the opponent raises to 5,200. This is very bizarre. The opponent has about 14,000 total. If he has what he's representing, which is the ace high flush, a full house, or better, I'd expect him to flat and let me bluff off another huge portion of my stack on the river. When he raises here, it feels much more like some sort of bluff with either ace queen or ace king offsuit containing the ace of hearts, or maybe he doesn't know what to do with a hand like pocket nines or pocket tens with the heart and wants to see where he's at. Could be raising with the smaller flush, but we have the king of hearts blocker, making those less likely. When I narrow his range down to mostly hands that are either semi-bluffing or won't want to see this pocket any bigger, it makes me want to stick around. The main issue is that we only have ace high at the moment, and there's only one card to come. My instincts are that my opponent isn't strong enough to withstand a re-raise. He only has 9,000 on top of the 5,200 that he already put in the middle. Our hand should theoretically be a fold. I'm deviating. I'm going with the read. Have you covered? I didn't add on 15,000 for show. I did it to put those chips to use, and that's what we're doing now. We fade the snap call, so we're not up against the full house or the ace high flush. This is very important because it means that we either have a ton of outs against the middling pocket pair type of hand, including any heart, ace, king, or deuce. Or ace king offsuit could even be best if we're up against ace queen offsuit with the ace of hearts. Regardless of what the opponent chooses to do, I'm taking some solace in the fact that I put him to the test. Even if he has the queen high flush, he's not going to be fist pump getting it in for an additional $9,000. 
that sort of hand will still be forced to call. Plenty of time has elapsed now, so I don't suspect that that's what the opponent has. He likely has something much weaker. A minute and 40 seconds later, we finally hear from the opponent. Well, we started it, okay. and then there was one seat. And then All right, the way, that know. was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I think you play better live cash games than get on those. Maybe. We get perhaps the most exciting 3-bet bluff shove through in my life to be up almost $10,000 on the session. The read won't be right all the time, but this is when playing nosebleed games at the lodge and in a few other sessions helps me out the most. It allows me to be more comfortable making plays like this when I feel like it's going to work. We earned this 5k chip by risking everything when the opponent says that he should have jammed over my $1,900 bet to make me make the decision, he's indicating that he probably did have either ace-king or ace-queen offsuit with the ace of hearts. About an hour in, we pick up ace-king offsuit in the small blind, there are straddles on nearly every hand including this one. The hijack raises to 50. The cutoff has been playing on the wilder side, he lives up to his reputation with a 3 bet to 150. We've got a couple of options, I use a 50-50, then I pull the audience, the right answer ends up being pretty clear. We have to punish the opponents. I put in the cold 4 bet to 500. It should send a signal more clear than the wow. The hijack picks up on it and folds. The cutoff is a gambling man. He makes the call for 350 more. We're heads up out of position in what's already a four figure pot. The flop comes jack 10 deuce with two spades. We've got a gutter with two overs and a backdoor spade draw. There's a decent amount going on with our hand, but I expect the cutoff to at least occasionally have strong holdings, like sets of jacks and tens, in addition to over pairs. I definitely like to make it to at least a turn card. I check to ensure that we don't get blown off of our potential. This isn't a Costco, so we won't be getting anything for free. The cutoff bet's 330. Even though I haven't put out as many YouTube videos lately due to playing a lot, I can still afford that amount. I make the call. Ideally, we can drill a queen of some sort. The turn is the eight of spades. It's not exactly what we wanted, but we at least pick up a draw to the ace high flush. And almost equally important, we have a key blocker. I check to the cutoff once more. I wouldn't expect him to bet that frequently for value, given that this should be a scary turn card. I can definitely have some flushes that I would have played this way. The cutoff can't be stopped. He puts in a suspect bet of 600. I've got 1810 total. I don't really want to just flat the 600. I'm not entirely sure what the cutoff has. I know what he doesn't have though these loose aggressive opponents who bet 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 sometimes you've got to put them to the test that's what we do Boing. we get a count of our stack to confirm that we have another 12 10 on top of the cutoffs bet our all-in doesn't get snap called i'm glad to have chips in front of me at least a little longer we still would like to see a fold otherwise we're going to need some help in the form of a spade or queen the opponent takes his time it's a big decision finally he makes the call, it hurts to see it, but all hope isn't lost. We've gotta have some outs. It's a pot well over $5,000. The river is another jack. It's extremely disappointing. I turn over what's become complete air. We'd be absolutely nothing. The cutoff reveals that he has pocket tens for a full house. It's a monster hand that we ran into, like I'm sure some of you suspected. Except he doesn't actually show his cards at all. He looks at him in disbelief because he doesn't have the winner. Our ace-king offsuit is somehow the best hand in a massive all-in. It's rare that a semi-bluff shove on the turn gets called, doesn't improve, and still gets the win. Maybe today is our day. We're up a few thousand. The opponent would later tell me that he had king-queen offsuit with a spade. He was drawing slim against us and gets exactly what he deserves for calling our cold 4-bet light. The clock is about to strike midnight as we pick up ace-king offsuit under the gun plus one. We've had this hand a few times a day, but it hasn't helped us much up to this point. I raised to 30. There's a solid pro named Brian who's originally from Boston in the cutoff. He three bets to 100. He's three bet me multiple times today, including as a squeeze from the big blind of pocket eights that got the showdown. Three bet squeezing pocket eights in that particular spot is only supposed to be done at a very small frequency, and the fact that Brian went for it tells me that he's certainly making aggressive plays more than most people would. Because of that, I'm going to 4-bet at a higher frequency, and the opponent knows it. I re-raised to 330. This is actually the second time in a row that he's 3-bet me, and I 4-bet him with ace-king offsuit. On the other hand, he folded quickly, and it didn't get the showdown. He may be tired of me 4-betting. He 5-bets to 700. 
Sure, he could have aces or kings, but we have removal of those holdings. And if the opponent is capable of 3-betting me light, he's likely capable of 5-betting me at a higher than normal frequency as well. The cutoff has 31-20 total in his stack. We have him covered. There are multiple combos of ace-4 and ace-5 suited that he might be doing this with, in addition to the 9 possible combinations of ace-king that he could have that were tied with. With an ace and a king accounted for, there are only 3 combinations of each of those holdings that have us in bad shape, and really only aces have us completely crushed, we still have a 30% chance of winning against kings. I don't want to call and play a huge pot out of position, I want to force the cutoff to make the tough decision if we're both holding the same cards, which we probably are. On all of them. I gotta use IV cover. I like 3800. There's no snap call, so we're definitely not up against pocket aces. I'm more and more certain that the opponent has the same hand. I'm rooting for a fold, just to avoid the chop. He may have too much invested. He puts in a calling chip. Calls it. Chop, probably chopping, I assume, or the kings? We're up against pocket kings. It's the worst case scenario after the opponent understandably hesitated before calling the massive six bet shove. But we're still gonna win this almost one in three times. If I wasn't 11 hours into the session and stuck $3,700, running it twice would be a lot more appealing. At the moment, the idea of possibly chopping this makes me sick and I prefer to do whatever I can to reduce the chances of us splitting the pot. What may not be apparent is that I'm basically emotionally free rolling the outcome of this hand. If I lose and I'm down 7,000, that won't make me feel much worse than being down 3,700 like I am right now. 3,700 and 7,000 will both be stored in my brain as big losses and I'll process them about the same. If I win on the other hand and I manage to get almost completely out of the hole after playing 11 hours and being stuck 4,700 at the low point, I'll be ecstatic. If the opponent were a recreational player, I'd be more inclined to leave the decision up to him, but he's a pro who has a lead in this instance and he's asked me what I want to do. I'm in the mood to gamble. Uh, let's just go once. Okay. One time. We're risking everything to win a pot of over 6,200 and we're gonna need some help. We've had some brutal runouts and multiple pots earlier today that have cost me a lot of money. Maybe we can get lucky and get some back. The flop comes Jack-9-7 with two diamonds. It's looking extremely bleak since we only have two more chances at hitting an ace. Maybe we should run it twice after all. The only silver lining is that we have backdoor diamonds and a backdoor Broadway draw. The turn is the Ten of Hearts. It's an interesting card because an eight will allow us to chop and any queen will give us a straight, but our diamond draw is dead and we only have one last shot to improve. I've seen wilder things happen, but the way things have been going, it's hard to be too optimistic. If I win, I'll barely be down at all. If I lose, I'll have the worst losing session that I've ever had in a 5-10 game. It's difficult to even watch. Wow. That ace king is gonna win. Oh. Ace king is gonna win. Okay, you got it. We get the Miracle River card right when we need it most. They ask for a count on my stack just to make sure that I have the opponent covered. I put my stack in the middle so everyone can get an accurate look to confirm that I've got a few hundred more. Running it one time pays off massively, but I lost a few years of my life sweating the turn in the river. If we hadn't had a number of three and four bet situations come up previously in the session with this particular opponent, I probably wouldn't have been inclined to six bet jam, but the dynamics led me to believe that was the best play in the moment. I put us in a situation where we had to get lucky in order to win. It's not necessarily how I prefer to do things, but for the first time today, something goes our way in a gigantic pot. This win gets our stack to 6,900. We're only down $600 and booking a profitable session is within reach. So I'm gonna give it my all to make that happen. About five hours into the session, we look down at Ace King Offsuit. We have a rare stand-up game going. The one recreational player at the table doesn't like playing it and he doesn't like it when straddles are on. So 95% of the time we cater to him and don't play with either of those things. He happens to be okay with it at the moment. I'm one of the last players standing up. I need to win a pot soon. Otherwise, I'll have to pay each player at the table $200. We're onto the gun plus two. I kick things off with a raise to 200. It's a little more than my normal raise size to disincentivize players from calling. Everyone at the table recognizes that I need to win a pot in the next few hands, and I'll be playing a slightly wider range than normal, but this time, I happen to be enjoying the view from the top of it. Matt Berkey has returned from a break. He's already won his seat back at the table, but he gets aggressive with a three bet to 600. That clears everyone else out of the way. What's fun about the stand-up game is when we pick up a real hand like in this instance, no one believes us when we're pumping in big bets, fighting for pots. It makes it a lot easier to get paid. 
Another factor that could lead us to get paid more is Matt being down a buy-in or two, he could be more willing to give me action light. I go with a massive four bet jam for 21,000 effective. If we win the pot right now without seeing a flop and without making a pair, that's okay. If not, we'll be probably flipping or we'll have Berkey in bad shape. Matt isn't in the mood to give up. Right. You, Matt. Uh, what, are you doing? what am I doing? Um, let's run it twice. We're in over a $40,000 pot. Our assessment of the situation was correct. Matt called over a 400 big blind shove with only ace eight suited. It's about the best scenario possible for us. We have him totally dominated. This is up there for the biggest pot that I've ever played at Bellagio and the largest one that I've had 100% of myself for. When taking shots at higher stakes, it's good to try to limit the variance a little so that if something unlucky happens, I'll we'll still be able to continue playing in this game when opportunities come up with no sweat. That's why I'm happy to run it twice. The first flop is King-10-3 Rainbow. We've got top pair and have a commanding lead to lock up half the pot. The turn is the five of clubs. Matt's officially dead on this board. Running it once would have been fine after all. The river is the Jack of Hearts. I wish the river would have been an eight. Now it's time for the second board we can breathe much easier knowing that we're free rolling. The flop comes Jack-9 Deuce Rainbow, that's still a great one for us. We only have to worry about the opponent hitting one of three eights or hitting a backdoor draw. If Berkey isn't able to, we'll have about 30,000 in profit for the day. The turn is the nine of spades, giving the opponent a flush draw, adding to the tension. We just need to stay ahead for one more street in order to scoop the entire pot, which has close to the same amount of money in it as my entire salary during my first year as an accountant. The river's devastating. Oh, oh my god! I'm just saying it's getting yeah. 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 The eight on the second river is as painful as it gets. We were ahead through nine cards, but on the tenth card, we lose the lead and end up chopping the pot. That's the second time today that we've missed out on winning a gigantic amount of money due to running it twice. If you go back and watch the previous session of me playing this game from a few weeks ago, I lost another huge pot on the second run out in that episode. Altogether, run it twice in four big all-ins, and three of them I've lost on the second run out, and the other one I won on both run outs. In that sense, running it twice has cost me about $60,000 over the last few weeks. That's not really how you're supposed to look at it though. It could have easily saved me $60,000 if the run outs happened to be reversed. But let's be honest, they weren't reversed, so it's a little impossible to not be annoyed. The only good thing here is that the first run out is what counts for the stand-up game. Since I won that, I've earned my seat back, and I'm not on the hook to pay each player at the table $200 anymore. That second river was brutal, though.